Hello, students of Dynamics. This is Dr. Dan Baker with part two of our relative motion with slipping example. You might remember, hopefully, if you've watched part one, we focused on the velocity of this system. And now in part two, we're going to focus on the acceleration of the system. So it's going to build upon it. One thing to notice is that we're actually going to pull with us a couple pieces of information from part one. One of those I already highlighted up here is going to be our omega. The second one highlighted down below here is going to be our slipping velocity. Okay, so those two terms are really the reason that you need to solve for your velocity terms before jumping into acceleration. If you jump straight into your acceleration on this problem, while the omega in this problem was given, many cases you won't have the omega of all bodies given. And then you also need the slipping velocity because it becomes an input into the cross product for the Coriolis acceleration, which we'll use down below. Now, another thing to point out is we're going to pick the exact same order of subscripts, basically the same order of terms for our acceleration as we had for our velocity. So we'll stick with V sub C on the left, then we'll have, excuse me, it won't be V sub C, it'll be acceleration of C, acceleration of A, plus acceleration of P relative to A, plus acceleration of C relative to P. All right, so part two, acceleration. All right, so I'm going to write out my full equation here. I am going to write all of the different tangent and normal terms. Okay, so my acceleration of C is going to go on the left. So C sub T, tangential term, plus acceleration of C sub N, my normal term. That's equal to my acceleration of A tangential plus my acceleration of A normal getting into my relative term between P and A, my acceleration of P relative to A tangential, plus my acceleration of P relative to A normal, plus my slipping terms. Now my slipping in this case is gonna be C relative to P, and so acceleration of C relative to P tangential, plus acceleration of C relative to P normal, plus my bonus acceleration, my Coriolis acceleration, which is going to, I'm going to tab on to the end. Okay, so essentially pairing off all the tangents and normals like we had from our velocity with the added term over here of our Coriolis. Now I'm going to draw a diagram. I'm going to put it right below this equation so we can see all the different terms. I'm actually going to move it off to the side after I draw it just so my equations all kind of line up below this. And so I'll leave it up to you how you want to arrange things. Now this diagram is going to look very similar to the one that we had above, except we're going to have more vectors total because we have more acceleration vectors than we had velocity vectors. All right, so and I also just draw it as a simplified wire diagram so we don't have to worry about all the details of the drawing. All right, so here we have point A and coming out of point A we have that arm and fixed axis rotation coming up here through the apex of the circle. We call the endpoint out here point B. We had a red marker point, which we placed on um, this arm AB. We called that point P. And then additionally, we had the collar. And so this collar is attached, sliding along APB, also sliding along, along the ring. And so we called the pin on that collar point C. So those are all the different points. So looking at these various terms. Uh, for one, we can recognize that because this is a type of four bar linkage, kind of a strange, moderately complicated one, but it is a four bar linkage, we actually can predict the direction of AC sub T and AC sub N before we get started. So I'm going to assume, I don't know this yet, but we're going to say that AC sub T is going to the left. The part I'm saying I'm assuming is I don't know if it's going left or right. I do know that it's going to go horizontal and horizontal being tangent to the top of that circle because collar C is constrained by the circle itself. And so if tangent is going to the left, then my normal, I know its direction has to be going toward the center of curvature. So this would be my AC sub N. All right, moving on to the right-hand side of the equation, we have our acceleration at point A. All right, the acceleration at A, because A is a fixed axis pin, both of these terms go to zero. 
So anything that is a fixed point, it's not moving. It doesn't need an acceleration to keep from not moving. So it will have zero acceleration. Now looking at acceleration of P relative to A, always super beneficial to go ahead and draw this position vector. Okay, my position vector goes from A up to P. So this is my R of P relative to A. Notice the same subscript order as we're looking at right here. Now the tangential acceleration is going to be based upon the the angular acceleration, which would be alpha. Now this alpha happens to be equal to zero. The reason it was zero is because we had a constant angular velocity, as stated in the problem. Okay, so it turns out we have another term that goes to zero. That's this one here. Looking next, we have the acceleration of P relative to A normal. So opposing that position vector means we're coming back down in this direction here. My acceleration of P relative to A normal. Moving on to my slipping terms over here on the far right. The first one here is going to be in the direction of the slipping plane, right? Tangential of C relative to P. Now I could assume it's coming, C is coming down here toward point A. I've decided just to go with the kind of a similar assumption as I had on part one. Let's call it going in the positive X, positive Y. So this would be my R of C relative to P. That's an assumed direction. Now, the next term we have is the acceleration of C relative to P normal. That's going to be based upon our slipping plane, if it's curved or not. If you have a linear slipping plane, like we do in this case, because the slipping plane is the straight arm APB, this one goes to zero, okay, because we have a linear slipping plane. Let me just write that here. We have a linear slip plane. And the last term we have, which I'll be honest, very rarely goes to zero, even though it's the hardest one to conceptualize. And so I know a lot of people would love it if it went to zero, is this Coriolis. And the Coriolis is based upon a cross product. It's actually based upon a cross product of this omega and our relative velocity, which we found was coming back down in this direction here, our velocity of C relative to P. So we can actually even predict at this point, and we'll see this work itself out also in the cross product of the components, but we are going to cross this omega. Now it's actually two times the omega in the equation, but pause it from the right-hand rule. So fingers come out of the screen. Fingers wrap in the direction of this velocity vector. Okay, so um, fingers come out of the screen, wrapping in that direction. I end up with a Coriolis that is coming down to the right. So this is going to be the acceleration Coriolis. Now, one thing you'll notice with this Coriolis acceleration, it will 100% of the time be perpendicular to that velocity vector because that's what cross products do. Cross products find the perpendicular vector components. And let's continue with our computations. All right, so we have our acceleration of C relative to T. I forecast that to be or assumed it to be in the negative I hat. We'll see if that's true or not. Now, as we get in here to ACN, there's two different fundamental equations we use for normal acceleration. Keep in mind that for particles, we always use V squared over rho, and it turns out that we can actually use that term here. Uh, color C is really acting like a particle as it slides around, and we did just find its overall velocity, and that velocity was 2.4, so 2.4 squared divided by the radius of 0.4 gives us our magnitude magnitude, and our normal as we drew it is going in the negative j hat toward the center of curvature. Now getting over on the right side of our equation, we got rid of our first three terms. Looking now at the fourth term, this relative normal, we have our omega squared in the negative r of p relative to a direction. And then we have our tangent slipping term and so that's going to be a plus unknown value of c relative to p once again we're assuming it's going up to the right so a cosine of 45 in the i hat plus a sine of 45 in the j hat the unit vector is going up to the right and then we have the coriolis so the coriolis here is going to be um, plus our 
2 times our omega. Now, the omega is always the body which contains point P. So in this case, it's going to be the only rotating body, which is APB. And we're going to cross that into the relative velocity. So let me just write that here, the velocity of C relative to P. All right, let me go ahead and substitute in a few more things and get down to what our unknowns are and our numerical values. So the left-hand side here, C relative to T and the negative I hat. Uh, let's go ahead and leave this term as it is for right now, plus 2.4 squared divided by 0 0.4. That's in the negative j hat. Now, putting in, we know this omega value, it is 3, so 3 squared, and that's in the negative r direction. So that will be in the negative 0 0.4 in the i hat plus negative 0 0.4 in the j hat. So I can multiply that through. And then my unknown acceleration of c relative to p, let me just go ahead and multiply this through. So this is going to be in the cosine of 45 in the i hat plus acceleration of c relative to p magnitude times the sine of 45 in the j hat. And I'm going to just slip over here to the right a little bit to make sure I can fit this last term in. So I have plus a 2 times 3, right? 3 was my original angular velocity omega. So a 6 in the k hat. And I'm going to cross that into a negative 1.2 in the i hat. Let's go ahead, instead of putting this as a plus, I'm running out of room here, but we'll squeeze it in. Negative 1.2 in the j hat. Okay, so a k hat into a negative i hat, and then a k hat into a negative j hat. So let's go ahead and map those out before we move along. So a k hat into the negative i hat turns out to be a negative j hat, and then a positive k hat into a negative j hat turns out to be a positive i hat. All right, so just to save myself a little bit of room, instead of writing out this equation another time, I'm going to go ahead at this point and isolate things into my i hat equation and my j hat equation and basically reduce this long equation in fundamentally half. Okay, so my i hat terms, I have a negative acceleration of c relative to t. The negative comes from the negative i hat. Just bring it over because you want everything times a positive i hat as you put it into the equation. Then we have this is equal to 9 times a negative 0.4, which gives me a negative 3.6. No unknowns in that term. And then I have my acceleration of C relative to P. I could leave that as cosine of 45. I can also write that as 0 0.707. And then my final term, I have the um, 6 times 1.2 in the I hat for this final cross product term here. So we have that working out to be a positive 7.2 in the I hat. So my J hat equation. On the left-hand side, 2.4 squared divided by 0.4 is going to be negative 14.4. And then we have a negative 3.6 coming out of this equation. 3 squared is 9 times negative 0.4 in the j hat gives me negative 3.6. Moving on, my next term here is going to be my plus acceleration of c relative to p. Again, the value of 0 0.707, which is also the sine of 45 degrees. And then the final term is going to be the 6 times 1.2 again, this time in the negative direction, so a negative 7.2. All right, so solving for my slipping acceleration, I just have one unknown in my j hat equation. It shows up right here. So punching this through my calculator, I can find the acceleration of c relative to p numerically is negative 5.09, and that would be in meters per second squared. Notice the negative sign. It means that I assumed the incorrect direction, which is totally fine. It just tells me I, if I want to draw an accurate final drawing of all my vectors, I want to flip that around. We'll take a look at that before we leave. Now, when I plug this value in of negative 5.09 to the equation above into this term right here, it turns out, and you can cross-check this yourself if you'd like to, that the acceleration of C tangential works out to be zero. Okay, and the reason it's zero fundamentally 
is because in this problem, we had a constant angular velocity. With this constant angular velocity, it's not accelerating this arm. There's no alpha of this arm. Therefore, this AC sub T right here goes to zero. Now, there is going to be a normal. And the normal we actually already computed. Um, the normal is equal to the negative 14.4. Negative because it's coming in negative J hat, not because we assumed the direction incorrectly. And so just to follow up here on that last piece, we assumed that our, and I just noticed here I had an incorrect um, notation. I apologize for that. At this point in the video, I'm not going to go back and re-record the whole thing. My acceleration of C relative to P tangential, that was not my, my position vector, but my um, acceleration assume direction. We said that that is in the opposite direction and so fundamentally we should have drawn that going back toward point A instead of going out toward point B. So let's go ahead and wrap up computations with our final answer for the acceleration at C. So my acceleration of C. Now keeping in mind that I am using x, y coordinates as I write this in bracket notation, so x comma y would be zero, and then negative 14.4, which is that normal acceleration. This problem was in meters, and then all linear accelerations are in meters per second squared. And so that would be my acceleration of C, the answer to part two in this problem. I hope that was helpful getting you to look through one of these complicated systems, some cross products, sometimes we're multiplying a linear scalar value times a vector, but we definitely have to keep track of a lot of different components. In the end, we separate those out into an I hat and a J hat, solve for unknowns, making sure that we only have two unknowns in this equation because we're only gonna have two equations to solve for those unknowns. Thanks for your attention today and I hope everything's going well.